right now, 99.99% of the money and effort is going into narrow AI. Uh, so that's the unfortunate reality of, of where most of the AI uh, effort is being employed and very, very few people are working on, on AGI, on, on real AI. Longevity episode three, where our team interviews Peter Voss about AGI, artificial general intelligence. We discuss the difference between narrow AI and AGI and why it's probably important for us to create AGI to help us potentially solve the aging problem. Make sure you're on the lookout for our mascot, Gene the Chromosome. Say hi, Gene. Hi, I'm Gene the Chromosome. I'll be in a five-second clip in this video, so keep your eyes peeled for me. All right, Gene, calm down. We saw Gene in episode one with Jose Quidero at this minute mark, and be sure you're looking for Gene the Chromosome in our episode here, too. Longevity Girl found Gene the Chromosome in episode one, and our team had a 30-minute video conference with Longevity Girl and had a lot of fun. In episode two with Richard Hart, Gene the Chromosome was found by General Minsk, and we also had an opportunity to video conference for 30 minutes with General Minsk, and also had a lot of fun and talked about some telomeres and all sorts of other longevity geeked out type of things. So make sure you're on the lookout for Gene the Chromosome and enjoy the episode. So my name's Brent Nally. I have a YouTube channel with the same name, Brent Nally. Check the description description the link below so you can see all the links of the things that our guest peter voss will be discussing and you can also find me on other social media with brent nally so peter thank you so much for coming we'd love for you to share a little bit about yourself and uh, your company ai go so maybe a little bit about when it was founded what you guys are doing right now and what you're most excited about for the future yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, so, uh, yeah, let me let me give you a little bit of my my history for context. So, uh, I actually didn't finish high school. Um, I'm uh, certain personal circumstances. Uh, so, I started work at 16, and I'm entirely self self taught, and that works for me. It may not work for everyone else. Anyway, I um, I, I got involved with electronics, uh, got trained as an electronics engineer, started my own company then doing um, electronic equipment for industrial applications. And then I fell in love with software and, you know, th that, you know, really changed my life. Um, my, my hardware company turned into a software company and um, over, over the years I developed uh, several technology platforms including a database system, programming languages, an ERP, uh, software system. And, and so on, and I just basically love being in, uh, in, in software. Um, so my ERP company actually became quite successful. Uh, we went from the garage to 400 people and actually did an IPO. That was super exciting. Love to do that again. And, but uh, when I exited that company, it gave me the, the freedom to really um, think about what is the next big thing I want to do? What do I want to spend the next 20, 30, 40 years of my life doing? And, uh, you know, what I came up with is, hey, I want to make software more intelligent. I want to build software that can learn, that can think, that can reason, uh, basically AI. So I, I took off five years to, to study um, intelligence and cognition to really understand what it is that we're actually trying to build, to, to really deeply understand cognition and intelligence. And so I, I studied... Um, intelligence tests, uh, psychometric testing. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, studying philosophy, epistemology, theory of knowledge. How do we know anything? You know, what is reality? How can we be certain of things and, and, and so on? Um, also, how do children learn? Um, you know, how, how is our intelligence different from animals? And then, of course, I studied all the work that had been done in the field of AI, other people trying to build thinking machines. 
And um, so that over the five year period, I came up with a, a theory uh, design of how to build a thinking machine. And then in 2001, uh, I actually got together with some other people and um, we coined the term artificial general intelligence or AGI in 2001, we wrote a book on the, on the topic. And what AGI is really about, what artificial general intelligence is about, is really full circle, is getting back to the original intent of artificial intelligence. When, when the term AI was coined 60 years ago, um, you know, people wanted to build thinking machines, machines that can think and reason like humans. And they thought they could do that in about like six months or something. Um, and of course, it turned out to be much, much harder. So over the decades, what happened is AI has actually turned into narrow AI, where you are really not building intelligent machines. You are taking the intelligence of the programmer or the data scientist and turning it into code to solve one particular problem. You know, whether that's uh, container optimization or face recognition or, or whatever. So the intelligence doesn't really to any large degree reside in the machine. Uh, it's, you know, it's a, the synthesized intelligence um, to solve one problem at a time. You know, we, we felt we needed a term to basically distance ourselves from what everybody was doing. And, and actually today is still what most people are doing is narrow AI. And that really isn't intelligence. It's not really AI. And that is just such a fundamental misunderstanding and misdirection. And I understand why it happened is because building AGI is really, really hard. Uh, and in, in fact, let me take a little bit of a, a, a detour here. Um, the One of the big problems is that most people involved working in AI are either mathematicians uh, or logicians uh, or, you know, or um, computer scientists. Um, and uh, statisticians, you know, uh, and they try to, they don't really understand what intelligence is. They don't have a background in um, cognitive psychology. They don't even think like a cognitive psychologist at all. They only think in terms of logic, mathematics, statistics. And I'd actually like to make the strong statement that I th believe it's impossible to solve AGI, to solve AI, you know, proper AI, real AI. Um, without first understanding what intelligence is and not trying to shoehorn it into some mathematical definition or statistical definition. And that's basically what's, what's happening right now. And I think that's why we've made so little progress in, uh, in, in real AI. The, the, the motive, the motivation of building AI is to understand human uh, cognition. Uh, whereas to, to build AI, you need to take inspiration from, from what the human mind is. I mean, the best example we have of, of intelligence, but not get, you know, the, the objective is not really to under, understand exactly how the, the human mind works or how the brain does it. Um, you know, and the analogy here is we're definitely not trying to reverse engineer um, a brain. Uh, and the analogy, a good analogy is, um, we've had flying machines for over 100 years, and they fly pretty damn well, but we know we're near reverse engineering a bird. You know, so you, we have different materials, different tools, uh, uh, a different, different strengths than what evolution has. You know, evolution has billions of, of years and can experiment and has organic material and so on. Uh, that's not how we, we, we're going to uh, build AI, uh, in, you know, by reverse engineering the, the brain. So I... Uh, I think the most effective teams to get to AGI will be people who feel comfortable in understanding intelligence from a cognitive psychology point of view, but also have the understanding of computer science and mathematics and statistics and so on. Because ultimately, you need to turn the ideas, the theory that you have, the understanding of cognition that you have, the model that you, you, you have, and you need to turn that into working code. So if you purely look at it from a cognitive psychology point of view, you know, I have a cognitive psychologist who doesn't know anything about computers, who doesn't feel comfortable, um, you know, with, with uh, logic and statistics and, and, and programming, uh, then they're also not, not going to be able to achieve it. So it's that rare intersection of people who feel comfortable with understanding the problem from a cognitive psychology point of view, but then being able to translate it into... Uh, the, the actual hardware and software capabilities that, that we have to build, to build stuff that actually works.
um, you know, that's quite apart from the ability to raise money, to manage a team, and, you know, all of those other good things um, that you need to ultimately have a successful uh, AI project. Hi, Peter. Um, so my name is Rowan Horn. I'm the founder of the Eternal Life Fan Club, basically a mm -hmm. bunch of people who are wanting to live forever. We're wanting to cure aging. Hi. So I watched your lecture at, at um, the Church of Perpetual Life, and that was a huge, of huge interest to me, of being someone who wants to live forever. And so I guess my question is, um, I'm hoping that AGI can help us cure aging. Um, I've heard that AI is already like doing surgery, so they're getting in, in the AI is being involved more in medical care. And uh, I've heard the AI can like help prevent existential threats. So I'm just wondering, um, is your line of work, is your company trying to, do you think your company will be involved in like making AI that can help cure aging and help extend lifespan uh, for those of us who want to live forever? Right. Uh, absolutely. That, that, is, that is my long-term goal is to, uh, to build real AGI, to build human level AI so that we can have millions or billions of PhD level or beyond uh, researchers help us deal with the, you know, the big problems that we face. And, and obviously, disease and aging is, is one of them. Let me just shut this off. Is, is you know, is one of those uh, problems. But, you know, energy, pollution and uh, governance, uh, again, is a huge problem. I mean, look, ar look around us. Uh, we don't seem to be able to really put together a very effective system to govern ourselves. So for all of these problems, we need more intelligence and, you know, um, AGI ultimately will provide that. So yeah, that's my, my motivation is, is um, to, to have AGI to help us solve these problems um, in, in the future. Now, the near term, there's a, a huge amount of hype. Obviously, the big companies like IBM and so on, you know, will hype up their products and, and say, you know, it's better than a physician and you have robotic uh, surgery and this, that, and the other, but one needs to be very careful of what these things can do. Uh, they're, they're actually a lot more failures than their successes in that area. And when you talk about robotic surgery, it's actually still humans driving it. Uh, it's not that the robots do the surgery. It's that you basically have a robot that allows you to very finely ma manipulate things, you know, at a micro, so it's like microsurgery, and they're fantastic for that. But let's not confuse it with, hey, the robot is doing the surgery, you know, and, and we don't need surgeons anymore. It's a, it's a tool that they, they use. Uh, we, we're at the moment a, a long way away from having AGI to have, you know, uh, robotics surgeons that will actually do the surgery uh, or that will be able to reason. We don't have uh, machines that can hit the books and, and, you know, read about what the latest research is and understand it. There's, we, we know we're near that. Uh, again, because right now, 99.99% of the money and effort is going into narrow AI. And it's doing some, you know, some great things. I mean, in terms of speech recognition has become a lot better. Image recognition has become a lot better. But unfortunately, most of the dollars that are being spent in, in AI today, in deep learning, machine learning, are, are aimed at selling people more stuff you know, basically a targeted advertising and, and so, so on, uh, you know, where deep learning, machine learning, statistical approaches are very good, you know, to basically get as much information about people, compare it to demographics, and then push stuff down their throats, you know. Uh, so that's the unfortunate reality of, of where most of AI uh, effort is, 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 is being employed right now, and very, very few people are working on, on AGI, on, on real AI. So, um, you know, going, going back to sort of the, the, the story in 2001, uh, we coined the term and, and wrote a book on the topic. Uh, I then assembled uh, a team of about 12 people to actually turn my ideas, my designs uh, into various prototypes. So, so we did a lot of experimentation. So for about uh, five or six years, we were in pure R&D mode, basically trying to, you know, turn my ideas into, into working, working systems. Uh, and we tried a lot of different things, uh, you know, virtual, a virtual dog in a virtual environment, uh, you know, a mouse, uh, um, sort of a baby growing up trying to learn and, and sort of experimented with different things. 
And then over the years, we developed a commercial platform from this, basically a proto AGI system that uh, I launched commercially a company called Smart Action in 2008. And what Smart Action does, uh, Smart Action today is about 100 people. A smart Action automates phone calls. You know, so when you call into a company, you talk to a robot. Normally, people hate that experience. They just press zero to get to an operator because it's so awful. Uh, so with Smart Action, having this AGI engines, you know, early AGI engine um, managing the conversation. You can speak in normal English and it remembers what you said earlier. So you have a much better experience. So that was our first commercial uh, venture. And uh, it's clearly a stepping stone that we need is to commercialize us to, to raise the kind of money that we need to develop you know, human level AGI, um, uh, artificial general intelligence. But even with smart action, I found myself getting bogged down um, you know, with scalability, redundancy, PCI compliance, you know, all the sort of uh, normal engineering challenges you face in a, in a SaaS company when you launch a SaaS, SaaS company. So our intelligence development kind of went to, to a standstill, you know, because all of our energy went into building a commercial company and a platform and building that out in sales and marketing and, you know, all that stuff. Um, so I exited the company uh, six, seven years ago. Uh, smart action to start igo.ai, uh, the current company, to basically get back to cranking up the intelligence, taking it to the next level. So again, I hired another, again, a team, a new team of 12 people, um, you know, had to train people up, get to find the right people, get it on board, and that, that took some time. And then we spent basically five years improving our intelligence engine, our AGI engine, taking it to the next level. And uh, two years ago, we were at a point where we said, okay, we are now ready to commercialize the second generation. And uh, last year, we launched commercially, igo.ai launched commercially. And we now have our first uh, a few clients um, basically using our intelligence engine for um, hyper-personalized conversational AI. So basically being able to talk to the system, but the system remembers what you said. It can reason it. Can, you can have a... a uh, you know, intelligent conversation w with it. But, you know, again, we're at a point of launching a commercial company with limited resources, and we need to bootstrap ourselves, raise money, you know, raise more money to, to grow the company and, and so on. Um, but this time around, uh, I'm um, determined to keep our development team uh, in full force. And Smart Action, basically, what happened, our development team basically pretty much disintegrated uh, you know, the, uh, working on IQ because everybody got busy trying to solve sort of commercial engineering problems. So this time around, I'm, I'm determined that we keep our development team uh, intact and, in fact, grow it while we commercialize so that we can keep cranking up the IQ. If I had to put a number to it, you know, if, if Siri and Alexa had an IQ of 10, I mean, not that IQ is the right measure, but if they had 10, uh, we believe we're at 25 now, you know, with our, our system. But the beauty is our architecture, and we can talk more about that, our, you know, the approach to AI, uh, our architecture allows us to continue cranking up that IQ. We just need more resources, more people to work on it, to go from 25 to 30 to 40. We believe all the way to human level intelligence. Um, but, you know, it's... Uh, it's expensive, you know. You you need to, you need to have the right people working on it. it takes a long time for people to uh, really put their heads, get their heads fully around uh, the complexities of of what we're doing. Um, so it's not that we could just sign up, you know, a few thousand volunteers to chip in and 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 work on our system. It really requires the right kind of people trained up properly, dedicated, full time concentrating on this. So that's that's basically our game plan. And, um, you know, I, I, I've been asked this before, how long do I think it will take before we can get to human level intelligence? Well, if we didn't have financial constraints, I believe we could get there in something like seven years from now. So, um, you know, I, I believe that the, the hardware is available, the software technology is there. There's nothing that I think fundamentally needs to be invented that it isn't already available in some kind of prototypical form. Peter, this is Brent again. Mm -hmm. That's one of the main motivations that our team here who's interviewing you has for interviewing you to get more awareness to your work so that people can realize that 
we are dumping massive amounts of resources into the wrong thing with, you know, AI rather than AGI. Just like what's going on, you know, right now in the world, we're dumping massive amount of resources into trying to treat individual diseases of aging rather than putting in the research into aging itself. And so I see the similarities there. And I just love for you to share a little bit on, you know, how you kind of see those similarities and, you know, what is it that we should be doing to get this message out more? Because like I said, that's why we're doing this interview. This is the best way that we know to take our skills to get your voice heard more because it's it's kind of frustrating sometimes every day to wake up and realize that, man, the whole world just doesn't get this and the leadership is off. And uh, right. yeah, w- what's your take on that? Yeah, you, I mean, you're spot on. And, and in terms of the parallels there, you know, if you look at what Aubrey de Grey has been, been doing, and I'm a great fan of, of his work, you know, to, to zero in directly on aging and, and rather than, you know, individual diseases. Um, but, uh, and, you know, going back f- further, I mean, Eric Drexler's work in nanotechnology, there's a, again a parallel, you know, to that. Um, I mean, how much money has gone into, um, you know, real uh, uh, nanotech? Very, very little money. You know, basically, um, the, the the term kind of got hijacked into sort of more material science, and that's where all the money is plowing it, going in, into. So it's a very different, di- difficult dynamic. And in the field of AI, it becomes also self-reinforcing. You know, you have companies like Nvidia, uh, you know, just being incredibly successful because everybody wants more computing power. Everybody wants to solve the problem by, you know, the big companies have a lot of data. They have a lot of computing power. That's a hammer they've got. So everything looks like a nail. And, you know, if you want to make the big bucks, you work in machine learning, deep learning, and statistical systems. So it's very difficult to change the dynamic. I can give one anecdote here that we had a brilliant um, intern from Germany working on our team, and he really got it. He understood the cognitive psychology approach, he was a brilliant programmer and all that, went back to Germany to do his PhD. He couldn't find a sponsor uh, in AGI-related work, so he ended up doing his PhD in deep learning. You know, That's what he'll only, you know, his employment, of, obviously his career is now in deep learning, but he would have been a perfect person to have a career in, in, in AGI. Um, so, you know, there's uh, basically, you, you can't, you know, you talk to VCs and they ask you, well, what machine learning, deep learning techniques are you using, you know, and you say, well, none of the conventional ones. Uh, okay, well, we're not interested, you know, we don't understand that. Um, so it's, it's, it's funding, it's, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's difficult to break out of it. And then, of course, the other thing is, again, uh, having a longer term vision, you know, if you want to solve one particular problem, if a client comes to you with a problem and they want a solution, the quickest, cheapest way of solving that problem in most cases is to do narrow AI. You know, I'm assuming this is an AI type problem, is to do a narrow AI solution. Uh, and I call that the, the narrow AI trap. Even people who want to build AGI uh, you know, when they're actually faced with solving particular problems like beating benchmarks, you know, um, uh, academic benchmarks that, that people are interested in or solving a customer uh, problem uh, or winning some prize or whatever, the best way of doing that in the short term is to do narrow AI. You need to have that vision. You need to have that, that conviction, that total conviction that with narrow AI, you're on the wrong path. It doesn't matter how much money you, you throw at it or how long you pursue it, it's not going to turn into AGI. And whatever effort you put in there, yes, it may give you sh- uh, better short-term results, but it's fundamentally, uh, you know, you're barking up the wrong tree. I would, uh, I would wholeheartedly second that, this, uh, this whole narrow AI trap where we are now seeing the consequences of building this society where our economy revolves around clicking on ads. We're making people addicted to clicking on ads. But in terms of uh, life extension, what do you think iGo and virtual AGI assistance and all this interesting technology can do for uh, personalized medicine and eventually uh, tackling the aging process itself? Right. So in, in, in the short term, as I say, you know, at the moment, we sort of, if, if you had roughly use an IQ measure, we may be at 25 
uh, of you know out of a hundred that we want to get to. So so clearly we're not at a level where our system can you know hit the books and and read stuff and learn and and do high level reasoning and and so on. Unfortunately, but what we we are actually talking to uh, to some uh, partners that will will. Um, utilize our technology to help people, for example, manage diabetes, to have a personalized uh, assistant that really knows about you, you know, you know, whether you're vegetarian or whether you love broccoli or whatever, and can help motivate you to manage your, your, your condition, you know, uh, diabetes. Um, uh, and so that, that is something we can get our, our toe in the water. But really what we need is we, as quickly as possible, we need to crank up the IQ to get to a system that really is at, you know, close to near, in some cases, of course, much uh, higher than human level intelligence. So right now you said we were at 25 IQ. Is that the IQ of a cockroach, would you say? Uh, uh, you, you, can't, you can't really make that, uh, you know, a cockroach couldn't have the kind of conversation <laughs> that can have, you know, so you can't, you can't even measure it according to child development or, you know, it's not, it, it's not the appropriate measure uh, for it. Um, obviously, it can do some things really well, like you know, um, have kind of infinite memory and and you know do very logical reasoning and and, and things like that. But the the the, the flexibility of de dealing with fuzzy language and fuzzy situations uh, that humans are good at, you know, that that's hard, and you know we're chipping uh, chipping away at that. So it's it's basically giving more and more intelligence, and uh, I actually see the personal assistant as a very good way, not the only way, but a very good way of getting to AGI. Because initially you have basically a, a Siri or an Alexa with some, you know, that's personalized, that can learn about you. That's kind of where we are right now with our technology. We're, um, you know, on our website, igo.ai, we actually have a comparison between what our system can do versus Alexa. And you can, you can see the stark difference, you know, Alexa, and all the all of the chatbots, all of the personal assistant chatbots that are out there, all use the same deep learning, machine learning uh, technology that has some really really severe limitations. They have no memory. They don't remember what you said two sentences ago. Never mind what you said last week or, or whatever. And I mean, imagine talking to another human that didn't remember what you said two sentences ago, you know, or last week, you know. <laughs> so you basically, like that movie, uh, they have Alzheimer's. Yeah, and you, would you hire somebody like that as your personal assistant, you know? So they, you know, they, they now got a billion or getting a billion dollars. Of course, that's sort of uh, marketing. We're getting a billion dollars, you know, like Elon Musk put in a billion dollars up front, which, of course, never materialized. But anyway, they're getting a billion dollars from Microsoft now. Uh, half of which will just go back to Microsoft for providing the, providing their cloud services, you know. But anyway, uh, they truly believe they can solve AGI with just throwing more more data uh, at you know at the system and more processing power. Uh, so you know, if that the leadership has that kind of uh, view, uh, I don't think um, I would have a very fruitful discussion in terms of. Um, you know, working with them, and then of course the other the other thing is sort of the uh, you know uh, the problem of dealing with a really large or well funded company. Uh, where, you know, our company is fifteen people right now. Uh, it's very difficult to have a conversation that's sort of at all on an equal footing. You know. Hey, uh, Peter. Peter um, yeah. I'm interested uh, if if you have personally had any like maybe interesting conversations with your talking AGI program, um, maybe philosophical conversation, or I, I wonder what would happen, what do you think would happen if you asked your program, like, if it wants to live forever, or what would it, what would it say, do you think, or have you maybe even asked it such a question? Yeah, so at, at the moment, I, and I think, uh, you know, the problem with Ben Goetzel, Sophia, it sort of, I think, also um, misdirected a lot of people. Uh, I mean, it's a completely scripted robot. You know, it may have some random answers. It's a, it's a cheap, basically. There is no intelligence, but that's not how it was portrayed. And then being able to raise money, that was brilliant. But it's also, there is no AI around at all, nowhere near, that would actually, you know, give you its own opinion. So if you have an AI and it, it, you ask it, do you want to live forever? The only answer you'll you'll get out of it at the at this point in time 
is whatever you fed into it. This is the response you should be giving when you you ask that kind of question. So we know we're near uh, in in having that sort of level of uh, self awareness and metacognition in an in an AI. Now I have a pretty good idea. In fact, I think I have a very good idea on how we can get there. But you know, our system doesn't have that, and uh, I'm I'm sure that no other system. You know, it, it's it's basically a parlor game at the moment. If you ask an AI an, a question like that and it gives you some kind of cute or scary answer. Absolutely. A lot of people get AGI and ANI confused so easily. And it's it's uh, it was very genius marketing by the Sophia team to make her look like uh, as if they had built an AGI. And it's the right. same with OpenAI. They've never uh, that's still just a, a narrow intelligence. So it's it's really difficult to sort of get to understand what we're trying to do. Right. Um, Peter. Peter, what role do you feel quantum computing plays in getting us to successful AGI? Uh, I don't think it's necessary. Um, and I think um, from my you know, limited understanding, I'm certainly not an expert on it, but from my limited understanding is uh, that it's not clear yet whether quantum computers will in fact be useful for um, you know, general computing or whether they will you know, uh, be useful for very specific tasks. Uh, again, there's a lot of hype, you know, in terms of the, the breakthrough where we supposedly have quantum supremacy. Uh, th that's just, you know, BS. I mean, uh, it, it, it bas basically just was able to uh, create provably uh, random numbers, you know, but, you know, how big a breakthrough is it? I mean, you can provably create random numbers with hardware, you know, um, so I'm sure there's they're more subtle to to it than, than I'm giving it credit here, but uh, it's not at all clear that um, for general computing that quantum computers will will ever be able to do it. I mean, ever is a long time, but you know, uh, anywhere near on the horizon. But more, you know, it, it, I mean, great if there's some breakthrough in quantum computing that uh, can speed up speed up things, you know, a thousandfold, a millionfold. I mean, fantastic if we can use that. Uh, it would certainly help us tremendously at the moment you know we run regression tests on on our system you know tens of thousands of tests that we run and you know our current regression test takes like five minutes to run um you know on a in a in in, in the cloud uh if we could a have 100 times more tests and we could run them in you know uh one hundredth of the time you know get a million fold speed up on that that'd be terrific we could you know uh, make some improvement to our system, press a button, and you know a few seconds later we would we would know uh, you know whether that improved the situation or not. So yeah, absolutely it would would help. But um, I certainly do not believe that quantum computing is necessary uh, to to get to human level AI. Um, but yeah, if, if if we any help we can get on the hardware side, uh, fantastic. It, just a real quick comment on that why I asked the mm -hmm. question. In 2017, I kind of went down the quantum computing rabbit hole watching like every you know highest viewed video I could find on YouTube about it, just doing that kind of basic research on Google. And it seemed to me that the doubling, like the Moore's law of quantum mm -hmm. computing with the qubits, which mm -hmm. is what quantum computing uses rather than bits right. and right. traditional computing, it seemed to me that it's getting to the point where it is doubling like Moore's law about every two years and the doubling starting to get interesting like instead of doubling from like two to four like it had been for so many years to eight mm -hmm. to 16 now it seems to me that we're more in like the 50 to 100 and then 200 so you could see maybe in a few more years it could start doing some things that might get interesting but that's that's just the pondering of a of a novice out loud basically yeah yeah uh yeah i mean there, there are two aspects uh, to sort of consider the one is uh, they, you know, I'm talking to experts, they are st uh, a, a group who believe that the more qubits you have, obviously the more errors you have and the error correction may not be able to keep up uh, with it. Basically, your error correction becomes that you need more, more processing power, more qubits to do your error correction than what you're adding so that you actually don't get a net benefit in, in the final analysis. I, I, I don't know what the latest is on that are the two camps of you know people who be believe that you can cannot really escape the error correct correction or the error uh, problem. Um, maybe that's not 
uh, an issue anymore. Maybe that's sort of more more than settled. But the, 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 I think the more important thing is we don't seem to see any algorithms that are uh, sort of uh, general purpose computing algorithms that, that actually run on any of these systems. Um, so they, you know, they they can only do very specific, again, sort of narrow problem solving. Which, you know, I, I, I haven't seen anybody uh, talk about how they could possibly translate that into what general computing requires. So, but yeah, it, it, it's a it's a fascinating uh, space. Uh, wish you know I had a, another life or something in parallel that I could. Uh, spend more time understanding that or working on that as well wouldn't that be awesome to yeah. have yeah, yeah heck yeah well, um, when, final, we, when we can cl clone ourselves um, <laughs> yeah the, hey, the Peter, final thing um, on the final oh, go thing ahead or maybe we sorry before we maybe we close the book on the quantum computing is that you know i've heard so many intelligent people like you know ray kurzweil talk about ponder that hey we don't understand what consciousness is you know peter you've mentioned you don't think it's important for us to do that to to create AGI, but um, a lot of people think consciousness might be created at the quantum level. So potentially that's why I kind of asked the question. But again, I want to strongly emphasize that I am a novice in this. So it's, it was just kind of a, a, a question. Yeah, I, I actually have pretty strong views on uh, on, on this uh, topic, but as I usually like to leave it to the end because the conversation <laughs> tends to go downhill <laughs> once once you start talking about it, you know, people tend to have very strong views um, in many cases because they believe it's such something so uniquely human, you know, something connected with the soul or something so mysterious. Um, but when when people say we don't really understand consciousness and uh, the same thing with we don't really understand free will, you know, volition, uh, I, my, my retort tends to be, well, speak for yourself. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and it's a little bit tongue in cheek, of course, but I've I've actually written quite extensively on free will. I haven't written that much on uh, consciousness, uh, but I have I, I do have uh, quite a few articles on medium.com. Um, you can easily find them. Uh, you know, I, I, I've written on that. So consciousness is what Marvin Minsky calls the suitcase words. You know, it actually has many different meanings that are used in different contexts. Uh, and content, why he calls it a suitcase word is basically all of these different meanings of, of consciousness are thrown into, key, uh, into a suitcase, and then you close the lid and put the label consciousness on top. You, know, you really need to unpack the suitcase. So uh, what interests me is what kind of consciousness do we need or where does consciousness fit in in having a practical AGI? You know, what is it about human intelligence and and that's that's my motivation to build an AI that can think and reason and learn and can basically be a scientist. Um, you know what level of consciousness? What kind of consciousness does it need? Clearly, it needs more consciousness than a dog or a cat or a snail or you know if if a snail is is conscious. Um, so to take the sting out of even having the discussion of consciousness, I, I like to I prefer to use the synonym of awareness. So once you talk about awareness, then it becomes a little less emotional. And okay, then what what does the system need to be aware of to have human level intelligence? Well, it needs to be aware of itself as an active agent, as an acting agent, as an agent with agency. And why is that important? Um, well, it needs to be able to distinguish between actions that happen in the world that it initiated that it caused versus actions that happen because other people initiated the war because you know they're natural things so it needs to be able to form a self-concept of its uh, area of, of um, agency basically it also needs to be aware of its own thought processes in an abstract way it needs to know that there are thought processes of some form and what those are, whether it's confused or overloaded or, or whatever. Uh, it needs to know that it has knowledge or that may lack knowledge, that it has understanding or it lacks understanding. So it needs to have metacognition. And the, here we're going back to um, cognitive psychology terms, you know, psychometric testing and so on. Uh, you need to understand those terms. And once you understand them, um, you also need to understand the theory of knowledge and concept formation. Why are concepts so important? 
human intelligence, the main difference between human intelligence and higher level animal intelligence is that we are able to form abstract concepts, which is basically concepts of concepts of concepts of concepts. So we can have any number of levels of abstractions, whereas animals can only form concepts that are directly grounded in their perception, in their experience. Uh, and it's not totally a binary thing, but it's, it's it essentially, that is the key difference between. So understanding the ability, uh, the key ability of humans or AGI to form abstract concepts by themselves, they would automatically form a concept of themselves as an acting agent. So basically, having human level AI implies you will, as a byproduct, have to have consciousness, self-awareness. Otherwise, it cannot be intelligent. If a system, and again, you could, you could kind of imagine a human that wasn't aware that they are causing stuff in the world. I mean, you, wow. you can't even think of that, you know. So uh, I, I, I like the idea of using awareness instead of consciousness. That's yeah. a great, uh, great optics for the discussion. Yeah. But right. uh, have you often considered that perhaps it might have something to do with the way the differences between uh, humans and sort of the other primates, the, the way in which we uh, developed language, and that could help us conceptualize the abstract. And the reason being that we may have developed language because we, in prior to that, developed this concept of temporality, this concept of uh, right. uh, awareness, not consciousness of the future, perhaps awareness of the future. Uh, right. And uh, through that, we are able to understand our own deaths, and that way we can develop these values. Perhaps do you think that's something we should be teaching the AGI to understand its own death so it can uh, understand we, us we, better? We don't, we don't need to teach that at all. We just need to build an AGI that can form abstract concepts by itself through the experience it has, through what it learns. Um, and language is, it, is basically, it, 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 language is, is just incredibly powerful. It basically allows you to have a single tag, the word, that is a placeholder for a very complex concept. So you could have a concept like marriage, you know, high high level abstract or government or death, you know, or whatever. Um, and a single word can basically activate that abstract concept, which again has a whole lot, lot of sub-concepts uh, attached to it and concrete experiences and this is where grounding comes in so language enables thought and but thought also enables language so it's a you know it's a it's a, a virtuous cycle basically between uh, language and and um, uh, and abstract um, symbols basically you're attaching symbols to that and you can see that in child uh, development when children you know when people say the child learned 100 uh, 100 new uh, words uh, today uh, no the child didn't learn 100 new words the words were there the words were learned already over years before that keep hear hearing the words the concepts were there before as well because it had already formed the concepts through interacting with the word world, what happens when you have that language explosion in a child is they attach the word to the concept. And, you wow. know, that's, so that happens, you know, that can happen very quickly. And a, a brilliant, brilliant um, um, description of that is with Helen Keller's book, her autobiography of how she, and, and if anybody doesn't know about Helen Keller, look up Helen Keller, very worthwhile. Uh, she, she basically grew up uh, blind and, and deaf, and she had a teacher, and at, uh, at some point, she grokked language. And it was an instance. It was a particular instance in her life. And I get shivers still today telling the story that uh, her teacher was trying to teach her what the word, the symbol, the sign language for water is. And she'd been trying for weeks to do that, and suddenly she got it. It wasn't that particular instance of water that the symbol referred to, but it was any water anywhere. And that's when she had the breakthrough that taking that label, the symbol for water, the sign, in this case, sign language, and attaching it to the abstract concept of water, suddenly she became intelligent, and she, and she recalls how prior to that she led an animal existence, basically. So um, my theory of AGI, uh, I, I, I sometimes call it the, the Helen Hawking theory of AGI. And what I mean by that is basically a combination of Helen Keller and Stephen Hawking. 
so Helen Keller had, you know, very limited sense ac ac acuity. You know, she couldn't hear, she couldn't see. And Stephen Hawking had very uh, limited dexterity. So clearly you can be very, very intelligent and very productive um, without uh, good sense acuity and without good dexterity. So basically, uh, yes, can you have a brain and a vat kind of thing uh, that can be very intelligent? Uh, I think there's a lot of evidence that you can. Um, how much grounding you need uh, is not clear to me. I don't know what the answer is or how little grounding you can get away with. You know, how little sense, you know, dexterity and sense acuity. I, I think dexterity you probably don't need at all uh, if you can model other people's dexterity. Uh, how much sense acuity you, you need? Well, you obviously need to have access to three-dimensional dynamic, you know, input in some in some way. Uh, but potentially that could be quite limited. So I, I don't think intelligence uh, requires a, a lot of uh, doesn't definitely does not require human level dexterity or human human level sense acuity. So I see AGI being primarily a tool user. So it could use other people's. It could use other robots or, you know, dumb robots, dexterity to, to control it, basically. Um, and same with sense acuity. Um, now, I'd love to also work on, on robots and have a robot and have, our, you know, our brain integrated in that. But that's just extremely, extremely expensive and, um, you know, very slow and very painful to work with robots. So, no, I don't think it's necessary um, to have human level and beyond in intelligence uh, to, to, to be in a robotic body uh, at, at, at all. Rowan, I think it's uh, probably oh, okay. your turn. All right. Um, so you were talking about uh, Aubrey de Grey a little bit recently. Um, so you're a fan of his, which I'm also a big fan. Um, I was going to ask you if you're personally interested in like trying to reach the longevity escape velocity and Maybe if you have any strategies for doing that, uh, any anti-aging therapies you're doing, uh, maybe a special diet or something that you want to. Are you personally interested in like super longevity? Um, well, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't plant you there, did I, uh, with that question? <laughs> because yes, absolutely. Um, uh, I've I've been a member of Alcor. I'm signed up for Cryonics. Um, you know, for uh, more than 20 years. Yeah, my my, my magic wow. bracelet. So I definitely uh, would love to be around 100 years from now, 200 years from now. I've been practicing calorie restriction. Uh, so I came to America in 95, and I, I met with um, one of the pioneers of calorie restriction, Roy Walford. I met him personally and, you know, uh, extensively studied calorie restriction. And I, as soon as I learned what it's all about, uh, I started practicing it. So I've been doing it for about 20, 23 years um, so absolutely, I'm trying to extend the envelope of how long I'm going to live and be healthy. Um, you know, ending up in a duo at Alcor is the second worst thing that can happen to you. Um, you know, so you really want to try and avoid that. So I'm hoping uh, that we can develop the life extension technology. And, you know, my AGI effort is obviously squarely aimed at, at helping helping uh, that, that along so that we can have indefinite lifespans, that we can, you know, reverse aging. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm super interested in that. I'm uh, definitely an, a futurist, optimist, extropian, basically. You know, I believe in self-responsibility, self-authority, uh, rationality, uh, and uh, overcoming human limits in, in, in general and, you know, living for as long as we want to live. Do you have a personal, like, sleep strategy? Because uh, I've been really trying to perfect my sleep strategy for longevity. I'm just curious. I just want to ask everyone that question. Do you, do you have anything? Any um, advice? No, I don't really need a strategy. I just, you know, work really hard, long hours uh, working on AI. And I, I personally need a lot of sleep. So I, I don't compromise on that. You know, it's like smart, eight and, smart. A half, eight and a half hours, nine hours uh, sleep and just super active during the day mentally and also physically I, you know, power walk and, and do stuff. So, yeah, absolutely. I definitely want to reach escape velocity, uh, you know, um, aging escape velocity. That's awesome. 
Peter, um, based off you know all the previous information that I've consumed from you, and then as well as this conversation, you know, I feel like what you're saying is that if you are in a position of power in you know like the federal government or world government or a massive company like running decisions at Apple, Google, Amazon, all the above. Essentially, what you're saying is that you believe that you could run a team that could create AGI like super fast, like relatively quickly. Um, who are some other folks that you respect who kind of think along your same level who might be able to get into the position or hopefully this video can help you get into some kind of position there? Basically, just want you to get more resources, awareness, financial resources, energy, other people to understand these ideas. So kind of what I'm saying is, let's do a call to action for the audience at this point. You know, what do people need to do to make this reality? Because what you're saying is incredible. You know, we just yeah. want to help you and your team, you know, and support you guys and make this reality. How do you see yeah. us doing that? So working with other teams uh, pursuing AGI, first of all, there are very, very few uh, teams uh, working on it. And um, unfortunately, at this stage, you know, people who really feel strongly about it and have some theory tend to, you know, have invested a lot of energy and time into their theory. And it's actually very hard to collaborate. You know, it's sort of, okay, I wish you luck pursuing that and I hope it works out kind of thing, you know, but hey, I'm doing my thing, you're doing your thing. And to even understand what the other person is doing, uh, I, I, did, I did a sort of a, a thought experiment with you know Ben Goetzel's project, uh, um, and I think I might we might even have discussed it with you know Ben, ben and myself um, of evaluating each other's project because his his project, you know, going back more than twenty years is uh, is, is fairly similar to ours. It's not it's not that different. Um, you know, also has a sort of cognitive psychology uh, kind of background in, in, in many ways. Um, but it would really take me to work on his project for probably several weeks or maybe several months. It would take him to work on our project with an open mind for several weeks or several months to make an evaluation whether, you know, it makes more sense and what we are doing, what we are, what our own project is. And it's just not practical to make that kind of investment. You know, you look at the other person's project with limited understanding, with, with limited investment, and you say, no, I, this, I, I think what we're doing makes more sense, you know. So it's, it's, it's very hard, I think, for different existing AGI projects to, to collaborate. Uh, I, I wouldn't rule that out. I mean, um, there's, you know, Paul Allen's project, uh, for example, but again, they seem to be very much focused on a particular route. You know, they have basically academic milestones that they are trying to pursue very vigorously. And to me, it's way too narrow. There doesn't seem to be the right fundamental theory of intelligence behind it, you know, the cognitive uh, theory. So I don't know. I, I mean, I'd, I'd love to be able to talk, talk to people, you know, sort of not just at a conference or something, you know. Uh, to see if there's something, but you know, then obviously people also have their own sort of call it empires, you know. But their own, you know, are, are people willing to? How many people are willing to say, well, actually, we've been doing the wrong thing for the last ten years, you know, um, and you know, we spent three hundred million on, you know, going maybe down the wrong way. Maybe we should abandon it and go another way. Very, very hard. How many people in the world be willing to do that? So um, I, I think for us, you, you know, I, I'm glad you're giving me the sort of the, the platform here to talk about it. I think realistically, the best chance for us to accelerate our development is really with a deep pocketed individual, not a committee decision, you know, that have to ask their AI expert, but somebody who could listen to what I've been talking to, uh, you know, could spend, you know, a day or two or three or a week with our team or whatever, you know, be fascinated by the approach inherently, something that resonates with somebody and say, yeah, I, let's, let's make this happen, you know. And uh, I, th I think that would probably be the most effective way, you know. And, we, you know, we're talking, you know, 
to, to really get to a point where uh, what I call financial escape velocity, basically to get to a point where people will beat down your door to give you money, you know, and obviously several projects have got to that point um, for various reasons. You know, that would only take, you know, maybe a few tens of millions, not hundreds of millions, not billions, for us to get a project where we could very definitively show uh, the strengths of our approach, you know, and, and, and the roadmap. So, uh, yeah, that's probably the, yeah. I mean, it's not even donating. I'm, I'm as much of a businessman as I am a, a scientist. Uh, I love business as well. Um, so, you know, we, we do have a viable company um, and the, the path to building AGI done right can be a very profitable path as well. But it's basically doing, you know, building because, and in fact, there's a imp very important point um, that I, that I, actually is, is, is very important to make, that a project that is purely academic or that is purely an R&D project has a huge, huge handicap. And I've experienced it myself when we were in R&D mode and, and so on. And that handicap is you are creating your own benchmarks and your own uh, goals that you are working against, that you're testing against. And it's just way too easy to avoid difficult but essential problems. Whereas if you have a commercial project, reality impinges on you and says, look, you have to solve this problem. Don't sweep it under the carpet. Whereas if you're just doing, you know, an ac academic like, you know, um, op uh, open AI is or, uh, or deep mind, they are creating their own problem sets, you know. So, um, you know, beating a go world champion, fantastic PR, major, uh, major improvement. But does it move the needle to AGI? No, I don't think it moved the needle at all. In fact, it went, it made us go off in the wrong direction. And the same with uh, playing games. Uh, now, there may be certain ways of playing video games that could be instructive for AGI, but brute forcing building a model of how to win a game, again, is not the right way of, of doing it. So having a commercial company that needs to do useful stuff out in the world uh, enforces a certain discipline of having to solve problems that may be too difficult to solve, that, too di that you would otherwise not try to, uh, to, to address. So um, I, I think we actually have the, 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 the perfect scenario right now where we have, uh, you know, a, a, a commercial uh, business where it's very clear what we need to do for our system to be become smarter and more useful. But that same technology, the same problems that we're facing are the problems that need to be solved for AGI. And I have enough experience now, having done this for, you know, 20, 15, 20 years, uh, to also navigate this. You know, when, when do you take a shortcut for commercial sake? When do you basically do the narrow AI thing without falling into the narrow AI trap? Um, navigating that. So I think there's a real advantage in... Peter, you mean for the a, purpose of like generating revenue to keep going essentially and then get back on course to AGI, right? Is that what you mean by no, that? No, no, no. Um, no, in fact, it's not even so much the revenue. Uh, it's solving problems in the real world. That's what's important. And it's. And I'm not saying that you should you know, spend a year improving your commercial product and then use the money to go back to AGI and then spend time on AGI. No, I think that's not a, a good approach. And it's not so much about uh, revenue. And let, let me give you a, a good example here of, of revenue. Um, if we didn't need to generate revenue, if that wasn't an objective, um, we might launch IGO. Uh, in fact, we'd be very likely to launch IGO uh, as a personal, personal assistant, basically uh, a consumer product. Um, but from a commercial point of view, we can't do that because at the moment, nobody's willing to pay for uh, a personal assistant because you're getting, you, you're getting them free. Well, you're not really getting them free. You're selling your soul, but people aren't paying for them. So, um, but if we offered uh, a competitor to Siri and Alexa, to people that was truly a personal person, we call them a personal personal assistant because you own it, um, you control it, it follows your agenda, not the agenda of some mega corporation, it's your data, 
uh, it's personalized to you. So, you know, it's per really personal, personal. That's the kind of product we could get out there, and that would be completely in line with increasing the IQ of that system, um, you know, while having real-world uh, requirements. You know, what do people really need to have a useful assistant? Um, so, you know, that would be non-commercial in the sense of raising revenue, but it would be commercial in the sense of having a product that's useful in, in the real world. And I think that that's sort of the ideal way of actually um, pushing your AGI development as well. As long as you recognize always to solve this problem, there's a narrow way of doing it and there's an AGI way of doing it. And that you always pick, you know, you always pick the AGI way of, of solving the problem. So, I mean, the, the market just for conversational AI, which is what we're concentrating on, you know, is, is basically being able to hold a conversation but to learn, to reason, everything to do with natural language interaction. I mean, that, that market alone is worth, um, you know, more than $100 billion of recurring, annual recurring uh, revenue. Uh, it's, it's absolutely huge. And, and we obviously have a lot of, you know, business presentations and, uh, and uh, market analysis and projections to, to show that. But, yeah, we're not, we're not talking about unicorn uh, here. We're talking decacorn and beyond. Uh, in, in terms of, you know, the, the, the business capabilities. All big companies we're talking to uh, have a requirement for intelligent chat, um, tele intelligent conversational AI, and they're all struggling with it. You know, they're all using the uh, conventional chatbot platforms, and they have dismal, you know, um, user uptake, and, 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 you know, they're really not managing uh, many many of them abandon these projects because they they're using conventional ai technology so yeah i mean the the, the commercial possibilities are um fantastic so um but ideally we we would want an investor who uh who, who really has this life extension long-term agi goal that that's really what's driving it but at the same time being super excited about the commercial uh, they are totally aligned in, in, in the business that we have. Um, there is, uh, unless you have a question, there's actually one, er one thing I didn't really talk about. You, uh, somebody asked it right at the beginning, and that is sort of what, what approach do we use? You know, what, what is our approach to AI? And I've, I've spoken, you know, indirectly about it. Um, but one of the ways to describe it is, is actually um, a definition um, by DARPA, uh, they've uh, been giving presentations. Uh, in fact, they have a fund now of $2 billion or something for what they call the third wave of AI. So if you, again, if you look up third wave of AI, um, Google that, uh, you might find my article, but you all should find the, the, the DARPA definition. And what DARPA means by that is basically the three waves. The first wave was good old fashioned AI. So that's all the stuff that happened for decades, you know, basically expert systems in the 80s and the 90s, you know, and uh, so all the kind of logic, logic based uh, approaches, um, you know, some neural nets as well, some statistical stuff, but mainly uh, logic type uh, approaches. And then the second wave hit us like a tsunami about eight years ago or nine years ago, when they basically finally figured out how they could build deep neural networks, how they could make neural networks work. And, you know, and that's the revolution we're basically currently experiencing is what everybody's doing uh, is deep learning, machine learning, uh, neural networks. And that's sort of the only game in town and it's sucking all the oxygen out of the air. You know, that's basically that's, that's really, you want to earn the big bucks? That's what, you know, I mean, they're paying kids straight out of college like $250,000 a, a year, you know, uh, if, if they have the right deep learning credentials and so on. So, that's a second wave. What DARPA talk about the third wave is basically adaptive reasoning systems, or you know, one way I describe them as cognitive architectures. So it's where you have inherently an architecture that has all of the components required for cognition, for intelligence. Because intelligence has certain requirements. One of the requirements is, or at least the intelligence we're interested in, uh, um, you know, to do, to help us with the kind of things we want, it needs to be able to learn interactively. 
deep learning, machine learning cannot learn interactively. It's trained at the factory, basically with massive amounts of data. You number crunch it, you build the model, and then the model is deployed. But once the model is deployed, it doesn't learn. It has to go back to the factory to, to learn. So you need, uh, you need one of the key components uh, is uh, that the system can learn interactively and that it can adjust its knowledge interactively as it's interacting with, uh, with, with the world. It also needs a knowledge representation that can do concept formation, that you can have abstract reasoning. So it needs to inherently have the ability to reason, to do ab abstract uh, reasoning. So it needs short-term memory, long-term memory, ability to reason, needs a knowledge representation, uh, and a couple of other things that are necessary. And a cognitive architecture basically ensures that you have all of the capabilities and the components required for intelligence in it. So that is the third wave that will give you adaptive, interactive, so one-shot learning. You know, hear something once. Um, a child, you can show it the photograph of a, of a giraffe. It's never seen a giraffe before. You can show it a photograph or a drawing of a giraffe. One show, one, one drawing, and it'll be able to recognize toy giraffes, you know, white giraffes, uh, al albino giraffes, or whatever, you know. Uh, sitting, running, walking, you know, what, whatever, no problem. With, with deep learning, can't do that. So you need one-shot learning, you know, that uh, is, is one of the requirements. So the whole list, again, I've written up about that, what the requirements are. And the third wave of AI is basically saying that's what we need. We need adaptive reasoning, learning uh, AI. And that's basically what I figured out 20 years ago when I did my initial research uh, on this um, uh, do, came up with this cognitive architecture, and that's what we've been uh, building and commercializing and perfecting, you know, over the years. Peter, what's your stance on regulation in AI? You know, Elon Musk thinks that there should be more regulation. Uh, what's your stance on that? Well, yeah, I mean, people who want regulation, you know, typically, if they're going to be the regulators, <laughs> Or if they're not powerful enough, then uh, maybe they want to regulate the people that, that are more powerful than themselves, you know. I, I, I mean, I think it's sort of, there's no practical proposal. I mean, it's all just posturing, basically. You know, how are you actually going to regulate uh, AI? Uh, if you believe that it's just the size of the computer, ultimately, that, you know, that's, that's going to matter, well, are you going to prevent, then who's going to have AI? Well, obviously, the biggest governments uh, are going to have the biggest computers. You're not going to tell them that they're going to co curtail the size of computers that they have. So if you believe, you know, processing power is basically what's going to determine the level of power or intelligence, then, well, yeah, it basically com comes back to, to, to government. But if it's not processing power, then the rest just, just blah, 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 you know, I mean, like, just a whole long laundry list of niceties, you say, um, but, you know, with commercial pressure, no, no company is going to stop its development. I mean, look, look at even OpenAI, how quickly they changed into a commercial company, you know, because, you know, and Elon Musk, I guess, lost interest because they weren't, they weren't willing to do enough that would actually help him with his cars and rockets, you know? Uh, so yeah, I definitely agree. It's a lot of moral posturing and not a lot of actually enforceable policies that are being thrown around here. Right. And, uh, you know, from, from my point, of course, I, I come from a different direction anyway in terms of AI risk that I believe, I firmly believe that AI will make us better people. So I think the more people can have AI, uh, the more people will have access to good advice to basically overcome those human limitations that we have. The things, you know, the things that are most likely to make us make bad decisions or make us do immoral things, basically, you know, that's harmful things, is acting out of, uh, you know, <laughs> acting emotionally, acting with insufficient knowledge, not thinking things through properly. If we have our personal AIs or we have access to AIs, that can talk reason to us, you know, that can basically um, make a, hey, maybe you want to, maybe going uh, going to Iraq and bombing the hell out of them 
is not actually going to achieve your objective. You know, let's just see what is your objective, you know, and maybe how yeah. can we best achieve that objective? Maybe, you know, bombing yeah. the hell out of everybody is not the best way. Maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. You know, let's just think yeah. about this. You know, we need AI to uh, save ourselves from ourselves. <laughs> uh, you know, that society life has become so complex and things are moving so fast that, yes, I think we need more intelligence. So I think the sooner we can get AI, the, the, the better. So speaking of, speaking of the coronavirus, uh, Peter, what are your thoughts on the coronavirus? Um, and do you think your AIG, AG high technology eventually will be used to prevent pandemics like this in the future? Yes, yeah, certainly there's some narrow AI, um, you know, if we're talking general AI and narrow AI, there's certainly some narrow AI techniques that can help, um, you, you know, with figuring figuring out what kind of protein, you know, sites need to, need to be attacked or whatever. I mean, you know, I'm no expert on that. But, yeah, there's certainly AI techniques or have, using robots to, uh, to, to go into infected areas or, you know, to replace people having to go there. Uh, absolutely. But yes, of course, AGI, once we have human level and beyond human level AI, and we can copy it a million times, a billion times and have, uh, you know, a billion PhD level researchers chipping away 24 hours uh, a day at and communicating with each other much better than humans do. You know, you don't have egos getting in the way. I mean, it'd be amazing the kind of progress we can make, the scientific progress we can make with having AGI. But you know, we have to get we have to get there first. So current AI, yeah, it's narrow AI can can help help with that um, at, at the moment. It's one of the existential risks we we have. I mean, I don't see the the, the this virus is certainly not uh, an existential risk. Um, well, maybe indirectly, if you know, real chaos broke out, but it's. I don't don't think it's anywhere near you know high on the list of existential risks. Um, it's scary, but you know. So getting near the sort of the end of the discussion, we're just going to have like some uh, closing questions. Where do you see AI going in the next ten years? Uh, you said a AGI would be possible in seven years if we had the money. But realistically, let's say things are going as they are now, would you uh, agree with Kurzweil that by 2045 AGI will be abundant? Yeah, I don't believe that, uh, you know, statistics that Kurzweil is using uh, can, you know, can guarantee that things will happen. I mean, f first of all, we could have a collapse of civilization and then, of course, it's not going to happen, you know. So um, it, it's not going to happen unless people work on it. Now, it's, you know, more and more likely as people realize the limitations of the second wave of AI, of the current deep learning, machine learning. And and those are very rapidly being recognized. There are more and more articles and talks. Uh, Gary Marcus has uh, been very vocal about that, of what's wrong with deep learning, machine learning, if, you, if you're trying to achieve real intelligence. So people are certainly realizing what the limitations are. Uh, they haven't yet come to much of a realization of what the solution is. Um, but that's, you know, that's a matter of time. Um, now, I've been in the game long enough. You know, we coined the term AGI in 2001. We certainly didn't think it, in 2020 we'd be sitting here and virtually nobody's working on AGI. So on the other hand, um, DeepMind did get funded. You know, it was bought for $500 million or um, $600 million. Uh, you know, there has been some serious money going into trying to solve AI. The fact that it was basically at the wrong technology or maybe given to the wrong people or uh, what, whatever, you know, that's just, well, one of, those, one of those things. But certainly people have, you know, there has been some big money thrown at, at trying to solve AI. I mean, open AI certainly didn't lack funding. Um, and there have been some other companies that, that have had sig quite significant funding but, you know, in, in my opinion, just haven't had the right theory of, of, of AI. So, yeah, I think if we're going forward, but it could be another 20 years from now, um, we haven't made that much progress. It, we sort of have more of like a winter of second wave of AI. 
you know, that people have really realized. You really think we're going into another AI winter? Uh, I, I don't think. I, I, no, I don't. I don't think so. But it's it's not impossible. You know, um, I mean, our project is tiny. You know, we just a, a, a blip out there at the moment. Well, hopefully after this podcast, we will be a bigger blip. <laughs> um, you know, but, you know, whether our project will succeed and get funding in, in time. I mean, I obviously believe that I put all of my money in, in, uh, in, into it and all my all my time. But, you know, there are obviously things that are beyond our, out, out of our control as well in terms of how how quickly we can uh, we can grow. So, yeah, I, I think absent our project, um, it who knows? You know, as I say, t- 20 years ago, I definitely thought we'd be a lot further than we are. Uh, same is true for nanotechnology. You know, um, been following that, you know, for 25 years. I certainly would never have thought that there, there's no serious program for molecular nanotechnology at this point. Um, that's shocking to me. Um, so, uh, Peter, um, wait, well, from what you were saying before about uh Elon Musk and his like wanting to push strong re- regulations. It doesn't sound like you're too afraid of the AI Terminator scenario that he puts out there. A lot of people think he um, is kind of a fear monger when it comes to artificial intelligence. Like he thinks maybe like the artificial intelligence is going to just come just destroy us all, right? Um, but what do you think are the chances? Like just a hypothetical. What do you think the chances are that maybe he's right and or maybe it's already gone so far that the AI has already, we've already created a very advanced AI and we're already trapped in a matrix or something. Like, you ever think about that? Have you ever explored that possibility of a simulation theory and that some people think, I think Elon Musk thinks that's a huge possibility we're already in the matrix, like, and it's created by this AI that we've, that has gone out of control. Ever think about that sort of thing? Well, um, well, first of all, it's kind of, pointless trying to postulate that it's like you know it's like believing you know ha- having the idea of of a, a, a god or a deity uh, as if that's going to explain anything because it doesn't you know then you just say well who created that so it becomes an infinite regress it just you know it's just our limited minds having the pseudo explanation kind of gives us some comfort but so the simulation argument um is, is kind of a pointless uh, speculation uh, to do. And certainly if the AI went out of control and wanted to harm us, um, well, it could, it could be doing a lot more to torture us if it wanted to torture us in the simulation or something. I think most of a pretty good life, you know, I think life is good. That's why I want more of it. <laughs> so, uh, so as far as the simulation thing is concerned, it's kind of a, a pointless, pointless discussion. Um, uh, I mean, second, there, are, there, there, are, there, there are some days though, when yeah. something so absurd happens that I say, it must be in a simulation, <laughs> 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 but that's yeah. more a joke. Now, as far as the Terminator scenario is concerned, I think it's a com- com- complete garbage. Uh, certainly the way it's portrayed that an AI will wake up and want to take revenge on us or, you know, now could an AI uh, somehow take over the world and not care about humans? I couldn't totally discount that possibility, um, but I think it's extremely unlikely because the AIs that we are actually going to be building will be built for one very particular purpose, and that purpose is to help humans. And they're not going to have any of the biological baggage that you know we have in terms of caring about their own, you know, survival or you know or, or dreaming about taking over the world or whatever they're not going to have these yeah they're not going to have the reptile brain we won't build them with it because it doesn't make sense to build them with it the most useful ais to us will not have a reptile brain if somebody wants to build an ai with a reptile brain um well you know fine they can do that but the ones without the reptile brain are going to be much smarter and going to be able to uh, control that so basically the good ais are going to actually be smarter than the bad AIs. Uh, one more question. Um, do you have any favorite movies that have to do with artificial intelligence? Uh, one of my favorite is Ex Machina. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. Uh, if, if they just didn't it didn't have the, the gruesome end that they had to, to, to do, mm-hmm. which was, 
was was a pity. I mean, her was also, I think, a a, a great a great oh, movie. Oh yeah, I love that um, one too. Uh, millennial, uh, what was it? Millennial Man. Um, was that what it was called? Um, yeah, I think that was a great movie. But the second half of the movie again, just kind of uh, done, switch it off, turn off, <laughs> turn off. Yeah, no, there've been a few. Um, all right. Anything else? Peter, yeah, I'll, I'll get in my last question, Peter, if that's okay, if you have yeah, just sure. a couple. <clears throat> so, Peter, we really appreciate you taking the time today. We've learned a lot. I think that the main takeaways that I've heard is that AI has not progressed like a lot of the AI experts decades ago were hoping and thinking that it would mm -hmm. because we've gone off on the wrong path to narrow AI, probably for profit, more than short-term profit, more than anything probably um so we need to get back to real ai which is now what you and your team have termed agi in 2001 artificial general intelligence and so with that being stated the obvious things you've mentioned medium people should follow you on medium comment support share it with other people what other types of social media and other support can people do the call to action for the audience if they don't have tons of money to invest in your company what are the call to actions that people can do to support this? Yeah, cert certainly. If you if you know anybody, you know, I mean, we're always looking for customers uh, and large enterprise customers. At the moment, we can't afford to take on small projects. You know, just um, so you know, we we're working with large companies. So any uh, any um, large enterprise that has that kind of problem, they they're looking for high quality, hyper personalized conversational AI, um, love to talk to them. And, you know, any investors who this, my story resonates with, with them, um, be great. But yeah, sharing, sharing my medium uh, articles is, is maybe the kind of one of the most effective things. Our website, igo.ai has also has links to that, you know, has some videos and, and so on. So yeah, just spread the word, you know, and, um, uh, easy to find me it's easy to contact me i'm on you know linkedin facebook do you have uh, a twitter twitter address people can find uh, you yeah I, yeah um at peter voss yeah yeah peter voss. all right uh peter okay. thank you for your time and we promise we won't put a, a picture of a terminator on the thumbnail you have my word <laughs> all right, <laughs> all right. I, peter, peter I voss everyone that. yeah this was this was great and as you can see i'm super enthusiastic about talking about all of this stuff uh and thanks for giving me the, the forum here. So, okay. Thank you so much, Peter. Okay. All right.